What's up everybody, Genix Dividend Investor here. In this video, I'm going to tell you the top 10 behaviors and biases that really hurt investors, multiple of which I have myself. So as you watch this video, I recommend that you reflect on your own behaviors and determine which ones are holding you back from maximizing your returns. Finally, unless you're Dr. Evil, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Okay, now I've been investing in stocks for almost three decades. In that time, I've made tons of mistakes and seen various of my investments go all the way to zero. So sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, but the only way to permanently lose is if you quit and or if you don't learn from your losses. That being said, a sad reality is that according to JP Morgan Asset Management, the average investor from 1996 to 2015 only had a 2.1% annualized return. We see gold was at 5.2%, bonds were at 5.3%, a 40-60 portfolio of stocks to bonds had a 6.7% annualized return. A more aggressive 60-40 portfolio got 7.2% returns. The SP500 was at 8.2% and then REITs shined during that period at an amazing 10.9% annualized return. Inflation was at 2.2% per year, so that means that the average investor was actually getting worse returns than inflation. Ouch. So why do retail investors do so poorly? Well, probably because they're buying high and selling low. I mean, they sell in fear when things are crashing, and then they wait to buy until the market has had a big run up. Or maybe they chase trends. Like look at what happened with SPACs recently. People got all excited about them and jumped in, pumping them up, and now where are they? Unfortunately many of those investors got wiped out. People love diving into new things in the hopes of striking it big. But soon we all learn that having great returns with investing isn't as easy as some make it out to be. Our behaviors are often what helps us, or hurts us, the most with investing. Sometimes our instincts can save us, and sometimes they lead us astray. Like when I first started investing, I was super worried about losing money. I thought maybe I should just invest in government bonds or CDs or something with a more guaranteed rate of return. I later found out that loss aversion is a common bias that many investors have. So while it's normal to experience it, it only becomes a problem when your fear of loss causes you to not invest at all, or when it causes you to make poor investing decisions. If that's you that I'm describing, then consider focusing more on how you can win rather than avoiding how you might lose. For some people, the more they lose, the more they come to develop loss aversion, which is both understandable and unfortunate. I've mentioned this before, but the pain you get from loss is more than twice as powerful as the happiness that you get from when things go up. That's why loss aversion can be so impactful to your investing. Now to be fair, Buffett once said, the first rule of an investment is don't lose money. And the second rule of an investment is don't forget the first rule. So we've had it drilled into us to not lose money, thus we don't want to take risks. But low risk often means low reward, and no risk equals no reward. Assets like CDs might preserve your principal, but overall you're probably losing out to inflation. Therefore you need to be aware if your aversion to loss causes you to invest too conservatively. If you're young, you should get comfortable with taking on more risk. As you get older, it usually makes more sense to dial things down. That makes sense, right? So if you had to guess, who has the most loss aversion bias between these groups? Number one, Millennials, aka Gen Y, born 1981 to 1996. Number two, Gen Xers, born 1965 to 1980. Number three, Baby Boomers, born 1946 to 1964. Or number four, The Silent Generation, born 1928 to 1945. Pause the video and leave me a comment down below telling me what you think the answer is. The results are kinda interesting. The youngest group in the survey, aka the millennials, aka the people who just started investing, were the ones that financial advisors said had the most aversion bias. And then what we find is that the group with the second most aversion bias are the oldest generation, aka the silent generation. So the oldest generation is risk averse because they need their money to live and their working days are often behind them. And the youngest generation is risk averse because they're new to investing, so some of them might overly focus on not wanting to lose money. Interestingly, baby boomers were reported as having the least loss aversion. I chalk that up to the probability that they've been investing the longest, and so they understand that loss is part of the game to make money, thus they've learned how to best control their loss aversion. They've also experienced how more aggressive portfolios have often outperformed more conservative portfolios over the long run. Those with loss aversion sometimes don't want to sell when they're down on a stock, but sometimes you should sell a sinking ship, especially when you're more confident in another ship. So be careful of being overly sensitive to loss. If you find yourself checking your portfolio every day and you're getting stressed, then maybe you need to be a little less hands-on. 
Some investors with loss aversion, or at least those who are risk averse, may hedge their investments with assets that inversely correlate to what they have. Others might use options to hedge their portfolios. One way to help manage your loss aversion is to define guidelines for when you want to buy, sell, or rebalance. Doing that might help minimize your emotions getting the better of you. And if you find that news headlines rattle you to the point of you becoming reactive, then maybe do a digital detox and avoid all news for a while. I'm someone who loves following the news, but I don't let it drive my investing decisions. Okay, the next bias which I've seen multiple investors have is called survivorship bias, which is a tendency to view the performance of existing stocks as a representative comprehensive sample without regarding those that have gone bust. A great example of this was during World War II, where the US military was trying to figure out how they could make their aircraft more durable. The military strategists went to hangars and analyzed their fleet of planes. The red dots are locations where US planes had taken enemy fire. What the strategists initially concluded was that many planes had the same clustered areas of damage. Their first proposal was to reinforce the planes with heavy armor in all the locations where they had taken the most hits. They later realized that their analysis was done only on the planes which made it back to home bases. But what about the planes which did not return back? That's when they realized that the red spots were their locations where the planes could take a hit and still come back. Thus, they almost armored the planes in all the wrong places, i.e. the locations where they could take a beating and keep on flying. What they needed to do was reinforce the planes in all the places that were not marked by red spots, like the engine, because when their planes got nailed in those spots, they crashed and thus they never got to see that data. Now let's think how survivorship bias could hurt an investor. Let's say you analyze a company that has ETFs and you determine that all their funds are doing better than the market is. Awesome, you think, the company must know what they're doing. But what you might have failed to account for was that this company probably closed all their poorly performing funds so that all that was remaining were the funds that had outperformed the indexes. Tricky, tricky. Another example of survivorship bias is when you believe future performance will mimic some specific period of historical performance. Your decisions become biased looking backwards rather than forwards. Survivorship bias might cause you to ignore companies that went under, like Enron and Blockbuster, and instead only focus on companies that are thriving, which then might cause you to underestimate the degree of market risk out there. Be careful, survivorship bias can really dampen your long-term investing results. Okay, another behavior I had that hurt my long-term returns was what's called the gambling mentality. When I was investing before the dot-com crash, I would sometimes not research companies enough and would just invest based on a whim or what I thought would make a quick buck. Unfortunately, that's not investing, it's gambling. Every investment has some level of risk associated with it, and you never want to look at stocks like they're lottery tickets. Instead, realize that a stock just represents a piece of a business, a business that you want to understand intimately, along with understanding the market the business is in. A difference between gambling and investing is that the odds are in your favor as an investor if you consistently invest in good companies at reasonable prices over long periods of time. The odds are never in your favor with gambling, and instead the casino or the track or the bookies or whomever will almost always have better odds than you. That doesn't mean you'll never win when you gamble, but it does mean that if you keep gambling, then the odds are that you will lose more than you win. So if you find yourself buying stocks almost randomly, based on rumors without digging deep to understand the company behind the stock, then your gambling bias is setting yourself up for a harsh experience. Moving on, another bias I've always had is called home bias. Home bias is the tendency for investors to overinvest in domestic equities despite the benefits of diversifying into foreign equities. Like I've always invested in US stocks. Sure, historically the US markets have been the best performers, but the US is only about 50% of the global market cap. I've recently moved into a British company as a way to invest more internationally, and to be fair a lot of the companies I own get large parts of their revenue internationally, from McDonald's to ExxonMobil to Apple. But I really should invest more internationally. I think my next investment might be in a Canadian bank in my retirement account. And regardless if you choose to invest outside your home country or not, I recommend you research Ray Dalio's insightful work on how the debt cycle works and how America may be on the decline and will likely have a financial mess on its hands, which may cascade into a literal shifting of the world's powers. Anyways, another example of home bias is when the majority of the assets you own are in the company you work for. I've seen too many people get burned having all their eggs in one basket, so I like to follow the rule of thumb that you don't want more than 10% of your assets in any single company. Of course, you can always find examples of people who did well without diversifying, but I'd still recommend doing it. I had a buddy who failed out of college, but who also was the first self-made eight-figure friend I had, but he unfortunately didn't diversify out of his company's stock when he had the opportunity to, and he ended up losing most of it. But man, it was fun going to Vegas with him and watching him gamble huge sums of money while he had it. 
bottom line, if you do invest in international companies, then you need to do even more research that you not only understand the company and market and such, but you also understand potential taxes, fees, and currency implications. Okay, another behavior that can destroy investors is overconfidence, which is another bias I work to guard against. During the run-up to the dot-com crash, I had massive overconfidence in my investing abilities. My ego was getting pumped up as the market kept shooting up, and I naively felt like I couldn't lose. But sure enough, my ego got cut down to size when everything crashed and my portfolio fell over 50%. Most of us believe we are better at things than we really are. Ironically, many of us also suffer from thinking that others seem more confident than us. So what happens to overconfident people when they invest? Well, for one thing, they tend to under-diversify. Another classic sign of overconfidence is when people think that they can time the market. Like they sell out of their portfolio and then think they will wait for a crash to buy again. So many investors try that, but very few do it successfully, and almost no one does it successfully multiple times. I see comments now and then on my social media from people who talk about how it's not that hard to beat the market consistently. Like there's this guy in my Discord who is saying that he was averaging over 40% annualized returns for his first two years in the market, and he thought he could maintain that kind of return going forward. I hope he's right. If he invested only 10 grand right now, never contributed another dime, but achieved a 40% annual return for 20 years, well, he would end at $8.3 million. It's really easy to tell when you're talking to someone who's overconfident in their investing. They have unrealistic expectations of returns. Or they think their options strategy is guaranteed, or their stock is, or whatever. In my experience, those people, if they stick with investing, eventually learn that the market can remain irrational longer than they can remain solvent. Like, you might buy a stock way underpriced, so logically it should revert back to its fair value. It should, but it might take decades for that to happen, or anything could happen. But hey, I want everyone to win. I hope I'm wrong and that confident guy nails 40% for the next few decades and goes down in history as a better investor than Lynch or Buffett. The reality is that only about 25% of professionals beat the market. Think about that. Only a quarter of the brightest financial minds in the world outperform the market. Crazy. Another sign of overconfident investors are those that underestimate risks. Like many first-time homebuyers will make the mistake of getting the largest mortgage they can afford in order to get the nicest house. But they're thinking that they'll keep their job, and maybe even they're assuming that they'll get raises each year, or they might not be planning for maintenance costs or whatever. My recommendation on houses would be to get less than you can afford so that you can sleep better at night. Don't assume everything will always go smoothly. Another sign of overconfidence is from people who think their stocks are the best and other stocks suck. But come on, some stocks do suck. People with overconfidence are also often guilty of holding onto their losers too long. And similar to overconfident people are those that are overly optimistic and that don't think they will experience negative market events. Those types of people also tend to be the ones that will go all in on something. Investors who keep doubling down on a bad company might just be afflicted with too much misguided optimism. Okay, now the opposite of overconfidence is lack of confidence, which is another limiting behavior that can hurt investors. People who think that they aren't smart enough or that only rich people invest, or that they will surely lose, or that since they lost once, they'll definitely lose again. If you find yourself in that state, then step back, take a breath, and start investing again. Trust me, your future self will thank you. Some people who lack confidence might not invest with conviction, even in things they really believe in. Or they might always stay mostly in cash. Don't get me wrong, some cash is smart to have. But if you're always holding more cash in the bank than you have invested, then you might want to carefully dollar cost average in while still keeping a few months of cash for an emergency fund. A similar but slightly different bias is from people that let fear drive their actions. Like perhaps they're too scared to invest. Maybe they just can't stomach the thought of seeing their portfolio go down. The sad part is that the biggest risk you can take in life is to be too scared to take any risks. Another dangerous behavior I guard against is called the disposition effect, which relates to the tendency that some investors have to sell assets that have increased in value while keeping assets that have dropped in value, i.e. the whole thing about selling a winner for a profit feels better than selling a loser for a loss, even when you think your winner could keep on growing and your loser will keep losing. In the past I've sold stock in great companies when I needed cash instead of selling off my losing positions. The disposition effect can exacerbate your investing troubles if you're someone who hates admitting when you're wrong. A pet peeve of mine is when people don't take accountability for their mistakes. Like when my kids come up with excuses for a bad grade, then I often tell them that the person in the mirror is the one that's responsible as well as the one who can make it better. Life will always have hurdles you gotta overcome, and the people who win are the ones who will get past the barriers. Anyways, people with disposition effect bias often hang on to their losing stocks, watching them as they sink, 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 all the way to the dark and lonely place on the bottom of the Marianas Trench. 
That reminds me of how even a buy and hold bias can be harmful if you don't sell when you should. I think it's good to go into stocks with the intent to hold forever, but you should also be open to selling it if it makes sense. I did an entire video on when to sell a stock that I recommend you watch. Remember, even Buffett sometimes sells, so don't become a zealot about it. Similar to a refusal to sell is a bias called the sunk cost bias, also called the Concord fallacy. That was when the UK and French governments took their past expenses on a costly supersonic jet as a rationale for continuing the project as opposed to cutting their losses. So this is a phenomenon where a person is reluctant to abandon a strategy or stock because they've invested heavily into it, even when it's clear that abandonment would be more beneficial. Unfortunately, the sunk cost fallacy creeps into a lot of major financial decisions by people, so be on the guard against it. Maybe you're holding onto a stock because you're too stubborn. I'll name that the mule bias. Okay, along the lines of not taking accountability for your mistakes is a bad behavior called self-serving bias, which is a cognitive or perceptual process that is distorted by the need to maintain an enhanced self-esteem or the tendency to perceive oneself in an overly favorable manner. Are you someone who always blames your failures on external factors, but you always take credit for your successes due to your abilities and efforts? Like did you make money on Lockheed Martin because of your brilliant analysis? Or did you get lucky buying a defense company before Russia attacked Ukraine? Always try to look at things objectively without emotion, otherwise your investing analysis can be clouded by your ego. Now most top 10 lists only go to 10, but I'll give you more. I mean 11 is better than 10 and surely even more is better. So another behavior that can hurt investors is called status quo bias, which is when investors don't change something even though they should, i.e. they have a preference for things to stay the same. Most people dislike change. Change often brings on feelings of discomfort and change can mean it's harder to predict the future, so people resist change and just prefer to settle in their patterns in life. For example, maybe you've never invested in REITs because they're slightly different and more complex, so you choose to ignore them and you keep doing whatever you have been doing. Status quo bias can have a powerful effect in your investments, forcing you to hold on to them for too long or even preventing you from investing at all. A reason that some people don't make decisions and stay status quo is because they focus too much on potential losses rather than also consider potential gains. Status quo bias isn't always bad though. Like, status quo bias can help you temper your desire to do reactionary buying and selling due to fluctuations in the market or due to news headlines. I'll give you an example of how I sometimes fail with status quo bias. I almost never shop around for better house or car insurance. Oh, I think about it every so often, like when I get a competitor's flyer in the mail or I see a renewal is happening. But since I'm already familiar with the insurance that I have, I often do what's probably the worst financial decision and I don't shop around for other providers. My complacency gets the better of me and I just stick with what I have. That ties into another bias, which is if you always take the easiest path. Like after you got auto-enrolled in your company 401k, did you go and look at the various funds and expense ratios, or did you just ignore it all? You need to guard against the bias for inaction, i.e. when you aren't investing intelligently because you simply don't want to put the time and energy in. But you also have to guard against too much change, aka an action bias, which is another bias which can hurt you when taken too far. Action bias is a psychological phenomenon where people tend to favor action over inaction, even when there's no indication that doing so would point towards a better result. Action bias is one of the most common mistakes I see investors making. There's a saying I like, which is that your portfolio is like a bar of soap. The more you handle it, the smaller it gets. I meet people all the time that say they're buy and hold investors, yet they're constantly getting in and out of positions. They try high yield things for a bit, then switch to high growth, then they switch to precious metals, then they go to options, and bottom line they keep trying new things rather than gain any real traction or get a true sense of what their investments could do. This can also be due to a bias to chase the newest shiniest object. Sometimes investing in new assets makes sense, just like sometimes using new investing strategies can be beneficial. Some change is good, but be careful of too much change. New investors don't understand that often the best thing to do is nothing, and to just let their portfolios do their thing with compounding. I read once that Fidelity analyzed their customer accounts and found that the best performing accounts were of people who had died. Okay, another very common risky investing behavior is called jumping on the bandwagon, aka herd mentality investing. Those people see everyone investing into some new stock or trend, like meme stocks recently, and they do it as well, usually right before things go in the opposite direction of what they want. Warren Buffett summed it up best when he said that he gets nervous when others get greedy and gets greedy when others get nervous. He's the antithesis of a bandwagon investor. When everyone and their brother is suddenly talking about Tesla and now your mom is telling you to invest, that's usually a sign that the herd is in full force and you need to be wary. Another behavior that can hurt your investing returns is similar to herd mentality and it's from people who have affinity bias traps. 
That's when you take advice from someone because you like them, regardless of whether that person has a proven track record and competency with investing. Like there are people who blindly follow the advice of YouTubers. Never do that, please. Learn and then do what you think makes sense. Okay, moving on. Another behavior that hurts investors are those that are prone to confirmation bias. That's when you only look for, and believe in, information that confirms your own thinking rather than which promotes a different perspective or stock. You can always find things that will agree with your view. Like if you're a bear in the stock market, then tune into Peter Schiff. He's always a bear for stocks and a bull for gold. Why? Because he holds a lot of gold. So he's more likely to push scary narratives of financial strife because he knows that the more fear, uncertainty, and doubt he pushes, the more that should help his investment. There are people on YouTube who do that as well. They use their influence to promote buying or selling. Be careful, folks. Now, while it's healthy to broaden your perspectives, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to change your mind. What you should do is make decisions based on data and analysis and don't tunnel vision into anything without looking up now and then. Another bad behavior I see all the time is from investors who have a propensity for short-term thinking. Like they see a hiccup in a company and they immediately sell. Or they hear that it will take decades to become rich so they never start investing at all. Short-term permeates their thinking. They can't be bothered to grow a massive dividend snowball because they want to retire tomorrow. But the reality is that all the good things in life take time and effort. Short-term thinking won't take you far. You need to plan for the long term and then evolve as necessary in the short term. Okay, another common behavior which can hurt investors is if they over-index on what just happened, aka people who have too much recency bias. Like, think of your annual performance review at work. Is your boss one of those people that focuses more on what happened in the last few weeks rather than what happened over the entire year? If so, he's someone who suffers from recency bias. Or let's say the market crashes. If you quit investing because the pain you're feeling is too powerful for you to get past, then you have too much recency bias. Or maybe the market crashing causes you to move everything into CDs. But Buffett-like investors look at long-term trends rather than focus on what just happened. Most retail people invest more in bull markets and they stop investing during big crashes. But that's usually the exact opposite of what you should do. People who focus too much on the short term let recent events dictate too much of what they do. Like maybe you hear about a horrific plane crash and then you decide to cancel your vacation to Europe because you don't want to risk having an accident. When you alter your behavior in irrational ways rather than consider the probability of a repeat event, means you're succumbing to recency bias. Another bias I frequently come across on my social media is from people who suffer from hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is a psychological trait which leads investors to overestimate their predictive abilities as well as overestimate how they would perform in some historical situation. Like sometimes I'll hear someone say that if they'd been investing during the dot-com crash that they would have sold out because it was obvious assets were overpriced. But the reality is that assets were overpriced for years. And the internet was new and the potential of it was enormous, so knowing the optimal time to sell is very, very hard. It's easy to think you would have navigated it better, maybe you would have. But did you navigate crypto correctly? Maybe. Hindsight bias might be clouding your rationality. People explain events after they happen using the benefits of hindsight, but this bias leads people to believe that such events are more predictable than they really are. A way to avoid hindsight bias is to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Or even better, think of lots of possible outcomes and prepare for all of them. Realize that things rarely go to plan, but it's still worth it to plan. People with hindsight bias might also suffer from distorted memories of what happened, and they can develop overconfidence in their ability to predict outcomes of future events. Like a common saying is that history is written by the victors, which also often means exaggerations and outright inaccuracies can happen. That two-bagger you had turns into a ten-bagger the more you talk about it and slowly over time you might just come to believe your exaggeration to be true, like any good revisionist historian, which then clouds your future actions. Okay, and the absolute worst behavior I ever see on YouTube is when people don't hit the thumbs up button, don't subscribe if they haven't yet, and don't click that bell notification. And it's bad if they don't share this video with someone they know. Okay, now I'd like to shout out my newest Patreon aristocrats who have signed up since my last video. So thank you Party Dared for signing up, and thank you Step Sarge for signing up. Aristocrats gain access to my Dividend Portfolio Tracker Spreadsheet, which I use in lots of my videos, and they get special access to various private channels on my Dividend Discord, including one which lets you watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as lets you vote on which thumbnails I should use, and you get more direct access to me. There are limited Patreon Aristocrat spots remaining because of the hands-on support I provide, so sign up now if you're interested. Finally, don't forget to join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of investors on it from around the world. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. 
I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.